ideal platonic and uh, religious or theological promise of a primary world of ideas, a kind of a heavenly godly world, a world of a forelife and an afterlife that precedes and is prior to and is posterior to the world that we're existing in. The huge emphasis okay, of the Industrial Revolution on the sheer stuff of commodity or whatever, focuses the human mind in the Victorian era on the stuffiness, the thinginess of the world that we exist in, things that the hand, truth that the hand can lay hold of. And that materialism, I think, once again, poses a tremendous kind of challenge to our self-conception or to the self-conception of the Victorian subject, because increasingly we, or the Victorian subject, see ourselves as things, bodies, Okay, rather than a soul's ideas. And that is something which Tennyson is confronting directly, I think, in In Memoriam. And In Memoriam has, as the era's great statement to this effect. Let's begin with looking at the second of the uh, poems uh, of uh, the second of the cantos, which is uh, the one that begins, am I sharing it satisfactorily? Are you with me with In Memoriam to Old You? I'll read it out slowly. Old You, which graspest at the stones that name the underlying dead, thy fibers net the dreamless head, thy roots are wrapped about the bones. The seasons bring the flower again and bring the firstling to the flock, and in the dusk of thee the clock beats out the little lives of men. O oh, not for thee the glow, the bloom, who changest not in any gale, nor branding summer suns avail to touch thy thousand years of gloom. And gazing on thee, sullen tree, sick for thy stubborn hardihood, I seem to fail from out my blood and grow incorporate to thee. Well, the first thing I want us to draw our attention to is the macro structure of the canto that Tennyson is using in the construction of these poems, and in particular, the use of these quatrains in iambic tetrameter. We're no longer dealing with iambic pentameter, which is four, which is five da dum da dum da dum da dum da dums, as we'd experience in a sonnet, or we were seeing in John Donne. Now we've got just four of these in each line: da dum 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 da dum. Four feet, four stressed syllables across four lines in these four standard structures. Okay, and I want that fourfoldness or whatever to come across to us because it seems to me that they are in many ways emblematic of or mimetic of acting out this kind of closing off a metronymic, steady, regular kind of pulsation that becomes, as many critics have found it, in the end, a kind of stultifying, mesmerizing, almost boring and monotonous kind of pace to the poem overall. And I think that's important because it's mimetic, I think, ultimately of the depression that is so much a part, perhaps even ultimately the dominant part, the defining part, perhaps, of grief in its sustained form. Each poem, in other words, has as its, stands, as its central stanza structure this four-square, nailed-in coffin of language. And I want us to think of these particular quatrains or whatever as in each instance reminding us of coffins or of headstones, okay? These are the stones, okay? And they are each stanza coffins, okay, in which the underlying dead are lying. And they repeat themselves over and over and over again, just as the gravestones do in the graveyard, and just as the numberless or underlying dead do, underwriting the living in the way that they do across long time. That's the first poem that I want to particularly make. Okay, the first point that I want to make. But the second point is equally marvelously obvious, and yet perhaps necessarily blindingly obvious, whatever, and therefore needing to be brought into plainer sight, lest it be obscured to us. And it's simply that in this particular canto of the poem, there is a pun, which many of you, I hope, can see very clearly in the first line. We all know, or should know, that the yew tree is a tree which is frequently planted in graveyards. 
It's planted in graveyards in northern climates for the same reason that cypresses are planted in graveyards here in Italy, where I'm sitting at the moment, because it is, on the one hand, an evergreen tree and suggestive, therefore, of the life everlasting. It doesn't die, but keeps suggestive the life everlasting. But secondly, because it is, as he suggests, the term, the, the word he he uses is sullen. He talks about on, and gazing on the sullen tree. It is particularly dark. Okay, its foliage is funereal. It is draped in the kind of dark colors of mourning and so on and so forth. But Tennyson is using this term in a punning way as well, because you, w, I mean, Y-E-W, means, of course, also you, Y-O-U, you, Hallam. Old you, which grasps at the stones that name the underlying dead, okay, since Hallam is now among the buried dead. But you is a pronoun, it's the second person pronoun, and it's the most valent and strange of all words in the English language because it means us as well, okay? He is addressing, on the one hand, a tree. He is addressing, on the next hand, Hallam, you, and he's addressing because he's a magic magical instance altogether, a third hand, which he seems to manage to grasp, okay, us ourselves, old we, okay, so old you, the reader, is invoked, okay, in this particular instance as well, all right, so this poem, okay, this particular canto is about a tree, but it's also about Hallam, and it's also about the way in which Hallam anticipates us, as the future dead, okay? We too, okay, are, as it were, walking among the underlying dead at the moment, whatever. We are underwritten by them, okay, in the great insurance policy of the world, whatever, as the certainty or whatever that will meet us all in due course. And that, I think, is tremendously important. The rhymes of the poem, okay, in the case of all of In Memoriam, and it's particularly true in the case that stands before us, whatever of the two particular cantos we're looking at or whatever, do their job uh, in uh, the immaculate telegraphic way that I suggested a good end rhyme should do, okay? Stones is rhymed with bones, okay? The gravestones lie above the bones, okay? That's quite simply the case, okay, in hand, whatever. There's nothing particularly mysterious about it. But it pushes a little bit further forward to suggest something more than that they are merely bones which belong to the animate and the living, underlying the stones which belong to the inanimate and the unliving. It suggests, in fact, that bones are aspiring in some degree, ultimately, to the condition of stones, that the bones are themselves petrifying. They are, as it were, moving out of vitality and immateriality, okay, the vivacious self, towards the condition, okay, of the material stuff, okay, of the materialist universe, emblematized in its extreme by the stoniness of stones, okay? Bones belong ultimately to the world of the living and the flesh, okay? They are the skeleton, okay, that holds the living and the vivacious and the moving and the animate, okay, of the living. But stones, okay, are, the be are emblematic of the perpetually dead, okay? In this particular rhyme, bones, okay, are conduced towards becoming stones in a powerful kind of a way. So too dead and head are rhymed or whatever, and they connote next to each other, dead head, the death's head, the memento mori, that little skull, okay, worn back in Jacobean times, as I suggested, perhaps on a necklace around someone's neck or on a signet ring or something like that, or whatever, okay, and the rhyme once again, as it were, incorporating telegraphically at the ends of these particular lines, signifiers of the work of mourning as it's undertaken corporately in the circumstance. And we can go on and on again to say that the flock, okay, which incorporates the flock of Christ, the flock of the Christian religion, the flock of humankind, whatever, is always confronted by the clock of time, which is going to bring its bones to the condition of becoming stones and is going to take its head to one day be dead. Okay, this happens to men, and we can look at the rhyme again and again. 
Okay, and we can read, as it were, again and again through these rhymes, how a bloom eventually gives way to a gloom and that there is nothing that will avail us in the gale of time and so on and so forth. So even as we play along, okay, with these very hard, forceful, masculine, obvious kinds of rhymes, the kinds of rhymes my undergraduates hate because they think of them as old-fashioned and odorous, whatever, they nonetheless are working telegraphically or whatever to put spin on and add value to the kind of underlying rationated line uh, as it's trying to make sense or whatever from stanza to stanza and bringing about and bring about in us whatever a further a kind of incorporated embodied and amplified sense of the way of the argument or whatever at an emotional level or whatever in our solar plexuses rather than in our heads and in our particular brains we are as stones, in other words, matters strewn about the you. I'm going to use this word in another pun. We are stones, okay, matter strewn about the universe, okay, because that you has become universal, right, in the sense that I've suggested it, okay. And utilizing a, a word, the strange word that he uses at one point, thy fibers, he talks about, net the dreamless head or whatever, once again is... Uh, emblematic, I think, of this kind of Victorian preoccupation with the sort of a technical kind of uh, vocabulary. It's a technical rather image and term or whatever, and it reinforces this materiality. It's different from the organic term that he comes to in the next line of roots. Fibers seem so remote. Uh, it so belongs in our age to the technology of optic fiber, for example, okay, cabling and so on. But fibers belongs in the Victorian imagination to the great works of the looms of the of the of the textile factories of the Midlands of 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 England and the greatness of English commerce and so on and so forth. Whatever. Here, are the roots of immemorial universal. Uh, graveyard use or whatever are being, as it were, refashioned in the stuff of Victorian commodity, the fibers that make up the textiles of a world of stuff to which the living are merely returned, whose bones, once animate and living or whatever, become now numbered among the mere stones of a world of stuff. All right. I'm intrigued again also by this concept of the underlying dead or whatever, which is a wonderful expression reminding us of how death underlies all, okay? It's not simply that the death are underlying, lying under the gravestones or whatever, but that the condition of death, okay, underwrites and underlies life. It is, in, in, in other words, the underlying condition, okay, in which we find ourselves, even in the midst of life, we are in death. It is death which underlies us. We came from death. That's the strange thing that we often forget, that we've already been dead. It's a peculiarity of the fact, or whatever, as much as we dread it, we've already been it. And it was okay, say the Epicureans, therefore we should not worry about it so much. Death underlies livingness, whatever, in that sense, whatever. Not simply in the strict sense of the fact that bones lie underneath the stones, okay? But death itself, in the metaphorical or figurative sense, underlies life in a fundamental, okay, metaphorical or figurative sense as well. All right. And then, as I've mentioned, there's this gloom and funereality, this conventionality. We've come once more to one of the great tropes. We've got a tree again. When haven't we seen a tree? OK, in these poems that we've been looking at this week, we've got this tree, the yew, evergreen, but somber and dark, without a conspicuous flower, without the momentum of spring and so on and so forth. OK. And all along the pun running, OK, between the yew tree and yew, OK, uh, which is Hallam, but is also you, a the supervalent pronoun that is you, as in we, the reader, in situ to the posterity of Hallam, okay, and also the dead to be, okay. So a very simple seeming poem in all kinds of ways, but one which I think is very far from it. And nowhere is this more evident to me than in this extraordinary penultimate line, I seem to fail out from my blood. Now, this is exactly what I'm talking about when I say poetry sometimes exceeds the limits of normative denotative language. What on earth does it mean to seem to fail out from my blood, fail from out my blood? That's talking like a baby talks. Mommy, mommy, I seem to fail from out my blood. All right. It's not the way an adult talks because it doesn't give us a hard, rational, finite sense of self. OK, we grasp the meaning of this line, not by comprehending it. OK, because there is no finite way of understanding what it means to fail from out my blood. 
how do I go? Can I go down to the kitchen now and fail from out my blood? Mom, on Tuesday, I want to fail from out my blood. My teacher sent me home with homework to fail from out my blood. I ate linguine last night, so I'm going to fail from out my blood. It simply doesn't make sense to the comprehensive apprehension that we have of language. But we apprehend the meaning, okay? We apprehend it very decently in the first instance, okay, as a kind of fainting inwardly, as the being of the speaker falling rather than failing, falling out of kilter with his pulse, as that meter, okay, in the line itself seems to do itself. Okay, and coming adrift, therefore, of the life force that is connoted by the blood, which stands in its redness, in its vividness for the vital, in its fluidity, its liquidity for the living flux, the animate, okay, that which animates bones or whatever and sets them apart from stones. So we apprehend all that. But also, secondly, we grasp also a kind of anticipation in this particular structure, this particularly perverse grammar of death itself, shared in the swoon of grief that Tennyson is experiencing. What does death feel like? Well, it feels a little bit like grief. It feels like fainting in a kind of a way. And it feels a little bit like, as this line does, the imitation of death's failure of vitality, the failure, the stoppage of blood, as though to die is to fall aside from the passage of blood, the flow, the flux of time itself, the flow of vitality. And Tennyson, as we'll see so forcefully in the next canto, is very deft at effecting this mimetically in his powerful metrical failures, the way in which he gets the normative iambic tetrameter of these lines to fail and refuse, okay, the simple pulse that we would expect of the living. To dum 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 to dum, which is the rhythm of the living. We find I seem to fail from out my blood, okay, a kind of livingness still present in that particular rhythm. But we will see in the next stanza how very, very different that can become in the hands of a master. So let's look, if I can call it up, at the next of our poems. Are you seeing in Memoriam 7, Dark House? That's what I'm hoping you're seeing. No, we are only seeing you. You're only seeing me. Let me sh share the screen. Open share tray, Tennyson Dark House should be there now. Yes. yes. yes wonderful. Right. All right. It's got a wonderful line and it's going to make all the points and you're going to see it and know the one I'm going to want to talk about when we get to or whatever. But this is uh, a, an equally famous canto of in memoriam dark house by which once more i stand here in the long and lovely street doors where my heart was used to beat so quickly waiting for a hand a hand that can be clasped no more behold me for i cannot sleep and like a guilty thing i creep at earliest morning to the door he is not here but far away the noise of life begins again and ghastly through the drizzling day on the bald street breaks the blank day Right. The meter immediately, okay, classically, fantastically inverted in that final line, okay, fantastically inverted with this dolorous, grievous stress, okay, of dark house with which the poem, the stanza, the canto begins, dark house, we've got a spondy, okay, here in the next second line of the stanza, of the, of the first stanza is also a stressed verb, stressed word, Doors is also a stressed word, okay? So instead of beginning with the unstressed syllable, dark house, here in, doors where, we've got dark house, here in, doors where, these spondies, okay? This dolorous, slow thickening of the blood as it approaches, okay? The kind of cerebral hemorrhaging from which Arthur Henry Hallam, in fact, died. We've got 
um, we've got Tennyson mimetically, as it were, producing this kind of sluggish, reluctant blood of grief or whatever, because we don't wake up and remember the dead or whatever and go about our business with the kind of normative da dum da dum da dum da dum by which we wander down to this the kitchen and kind of put the kettle on the boil or whatever and make ourselves tea and stuff. Instead, we wake up and the thought of the dead suddenly come back to us, dark house or whatever, in which we find ourselves and so on. He magically manages to make that happen, but no more effectively does he do this or whatever than in the very final stanza, okay, in the um, uh, in, 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 in the in, in the canto on the bald street breaks the blank day, which we will come to uh, in a moment. Um, I want, though, to look at this very first uh, stanza of the canto, whatever, and just draw our attention again to the way in which the uh, extremity of uh, language in poetry is enabled uh, in the occasion of in memoriam, as in, in any poem, in this particular case, this elegy, whatever, to say more than what it's saying at to be able to carry an ambiguity beyond what is uh, being spoken about. He speaks here about doors where my heart was used to beat so quickly waiting for a hand. Okay, he's standing outside the door where he used to wait for Hallam to open the door and extend his hand, okay, to shake it or whatever and welcome him inside as the act of friendship, okay? But what we've got here is an extraordinary instance. He's speaking of the heart that used to beat excitedly so quickly, okay? waiting for Hallam's hand or whatever, in friendship or whatever, to greet him with a handshake and invite him inside or whatever. But because, okay, the rhyme st scheme goes stand, street, beat, hand, okay, it is not in fact in the logic of the rhyme scheme that the heart is beating as it is beating in the logic of the straight grammatical syntax of this particular sentence. Instead, it is the hand that is waiting to beat. So without saying it at any point in this particular canto, the situation that we envisage is very, very specifically that of Tennyson standing in front of the door with his hand raised up, ready to beat on the door. We see Tennyson paused in the action before knocking on the door of Hallam's heart, oh, sorry, of Hallam's house, okay? Although at no point in the syntactic logic of the sentences set before us does he say, here I am at the door, about to knock on it, but not going to knock on it because Hallam is dead. He leaves all that out, but he just leaves Stan Street beat hand to tell us, okay, that that is what he's doing. He's walking past the house and almost automatically his hand is lifted up as if to beat on the door as it used to do to knock on the door out of sheer habit and wait for the hand to, to shake, okay? So we get this extraordinarily powerful, poetic, intuitive, imaginative image of Tennyson, the knocker on the door, where Tennyson is in fact literally speaking about the heart that is beating quickly, okay? In anticipation of the handshake that Hallam used to hold out for him at the door. Do you see how the effect of poetry all right, is exceeding the syntactic sense of the line or whatever and bringing to bear upon our intuition and our imagination a secondary, perhaps even a primary, even more forceful image that is much more specific, okay, and holds the whole of this poem pregnant in the pause between the raised hand and the knock that doesn't come, that all these words, as it were, sit, okay, between the raised hand dark house by which once more I stand here in the long and lovely street, etc., 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 and ghastly through the drizzling rain on the bald street breaks the blank day. And as the rhythm and meter collapse, as we're going to see in that final line, the hand of Tennyson, as it were, drops down and fails on the bald street breaks the blank day. And the, and the, and the meter of the uh, iambic tetrameter, instead of going knock, 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 is instead the meter, okay, mimetic of the hand just falling limply by the side of Tennyson as he fails to knock on the door, realizing that Hallam exists no longer there to shake his hand on the inside. It's an example 
exactly of the kind of extremity of language taken beyond the syntactic properties of the sentence as set up or whatever in order to do what poetry does, to say more than what the words themselves are getting at. And only in a certain kind of language, which we happen to call poetry, all right, is this ambiguated supplementary sense of things, okay, possible. And I'm arguing that it is because grief requires, okay, more than the shared denotative statement of fact or whatever to be properly understood that the poet or the person turns to poetry in order to make clear what the circumstance of death really is like. Nowhere does Tennyson say it, but what is grief like? It's like walking past a door, lifting your hand ready to knock on it, realizing that the person who you expect to open the door is no longer there and letting your hand fall down again. And that is accomplished by the rhymes in the first stanza of this canto and by the collapsed meter in the rhythm of the final line of the final stanza of this canto. They are, in other words, prosodic cognitions rather than syntactic cognitions. And they are what we simply call poetry. Excellent. Once again, um, we come across, surprise, surprise, it's none of my design, it's simply what's happened. We come across again that pun on the word behold, do we not? There it is, second line of the second stanza, a hand that can be clasped no more, behold me for I cannot sleep. He speaks as he does in this address, which is to Christ, okay, in, in memoriam, just as Dunn's poem was to Christ and asks Christ to behold him. But he's also asking us, the you, that is the you tree or whatever, and we, the reader, or whatever, to see him, okay, for he cannot uh, sleep and like a guilty thing, he creeps at the earliest morning to the door of Hallam where he used to go or whatever. He asks to be seen. But that beholding, okay, becomes ambiguated in the concept of the poem as well to conjoin the sense, right, okay, of being clasped, behold me, which is what a hand does, hold my hand, clasp my hand, okay. So the prosodic power, okay, of behold, okay, in, uh, in, uh, enjoins us or whatever to read the word behold on two levels, simply to say perceived, as John Dunn said it, see me, OK, but also on that secondary or perhaps because prosodically foregrounded, whatever that perhaps latent but primary sense of actually holding, which is the business of hands, which have been mentioned twice in the two foregoing lines. So quickly waiting for a hand, a hand that can be clasped no more. Behold, it's very hard for us, OK, even though he's asking us to see him, not to understand that verb hold in the first instance as applying to a beseeching of Hallam to come back from the dead and to take hold once more of the hand that he would like to hold out to him, that he is holding stalled in the act of knocking above the door. That's a marvelous instance. So there it was, as I was urging you in Dunn's A Hymn to Christ in the author's last going uh, into Germany, it is the being held by the hand of Hallam, okay, more than the seeing by we the readers, okay figuratively in our imagination and literally as we read the page or whatever that is substantially being craved. It is this tactile, haptic beholding or whatever, rather than this visual or ideographic one. Once again, to look at the lines, we've got these marvelous telegraphic lines recapitulating the ultra finite, close kind of sense of closure, the closed order of things, this encoffining uh, that these uh, uh, um, iambic tetrameter four square four lines do or whatever. Door rhymes with no more, okay? It is quite literally from the door that Hallam will issue no more. That's the simple sense of the telegraph. But more so, it is from the door that more, not no more, but more is expected, okay? Okay, hand that can be clasped no more from, so we can expect no more from the door, but from door, yet we expect more. The resurrection of Hamlet, the, uh, not Hamlet, <laughs> Hallam, the coming back to life, 
of Hallam in some kind of sense, whatever. So once again, the rhymes, doing the simple telegraphic job or whatever, of uh, acting out things mimetically or whatever. He can't sleep, so he creeps. Well, sleep is a creeping kind of action, just slow action, okay? Doing what rhyme does mimetically, acting out, okay, the sense of what things are saying, but always impregnate in these particular rhymes, the sense of something perhaps extra, okay? Something perhaps musically straining beyond the denotative sense of language or whatever into the affect of realm, moving towards the solar plexus of the sense that there's being made by the poem and away from the cerebellum, away from the prefrontal cortex, away from our rationality, okay, and towards our senses themselves. And then this great last line that is well known and absolutely fabulous to look at, to look at the absolute collapse of the meter. He is not here, but far away. The noise of life begins again and ghastly through the drizzling rain. This very, very straightforward iambic tetrameter suddenly becoming on the bald street breaks the blank day, okay, where we get two unstressed syllables on the, and then three stressed syllables, bald street breaks, unstressed the, stressed, stressed, blank day, okay, da da dum 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 da dum dum all right, this absolute collapse of meter, mimetic of a trudging of the blood, not a strolling of the blood, mimetic of a trudging, a creeping of sleep, okay, rather than a kind of light iambic step of striding aimlessly into the empty rain, okay, but above all, mimetic of the collapse into tears, this kind of gulping of language, okay, as the subject dissolves in grief itself. We have here once again, and surprise, surprise, it's the alliteration of the letter B. I gave you as an example in the alliterative stress of Old English when we we're talking about Wolf and Edwacker, the alliteration of uh, Ezra Pound's example, bitter breast cares of I abided. Here we get it again. On the bald street breaks the blank day. Okay, the spat out b, b, b. Okay, beating like the stressed heart. Not regularly, da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum, but it instead under this great catastrophic stress, da da boom 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 da boom boom. Okay, so we see the oscilloscope, the electro cardiogram of this particular line or whatever, signifying the extraordinary physical stress under which the heart, okay, the pulse of the grieving subject comes. It's a marvelous line or whatever, and it embodies more than anything, okay, this extraordinary mimetic collapse on the one hand of suggested of the sublimely raised hand ready to beat, to knock on the door, but also the collapse of language, okay, into a blubbering, okay, the crying, the guttering kind of tears, the squall of tears that follows as the realization of Hallam's death hits home or whatever, as also the kind of stumbling, trudging back into the street or whatever, as the morning walk towards Hallam's door becomes no more the normative, habituative, iambic undertaking, but instead this ghastly, vigilant kind of undertaking on the bald street breaks the blank day and the movement suddenly becomes that of the pallbearer carrying the heavy load as it were of the encoffin stanza above him rather than merely walking calmly about the work that he goes about in his ordinary day-to-day -day existence. Good. There is always much more to be said about any particular poem we want to look at. We can note that he rhymes day with away, okay, because Hallam represents daylight and everything daylight represents joy and gaiety and so on and so forth. That's gone away now. We can note that he rhymes rain with again, because instead of daytime being a sunny place, Okay, he's now in a circumstance in which every day seems to be rain again and again and again and again. Now, in both these cases, that is not what the syntax, okay, not what the semantics, the sense-making project of language in these sentences taken as prose is intending to say. 
but it is what is left as the retinal afterprint, okay, in the kind of oral repository of our minds or whatever, as a kind of subsidiary sense that I think is actually a foregrounded one. But I think that when we read this poem, instead of reading the whole thing, we really read stand, street, beat, hand, more sleep, creep, door, away, rain, again, rain, day, okay? That's the kind of takeaway, okay, that these, that these rhymes, whatever, hanging on the ends of lines do, whatever. And they supply us with a subsidiary kind of sense, okay, which both amplifies, complicates, perhaps contradicts at times, or whatever, but backwashes through the sense-making project of the poem, whatever, to give us a moreness, or whatever, a deeper, more profound understanding of the relation of the grieving subject to the grievous one, to the grieved one, I should say. Let me conclude then by saying the following. We tend to think of love as an intrinsically positive affect. It's wonderful to be in love. There are any number of songs which tell us that that's the occasion. And we tend to think of grief as an intrinsically negative affect. But the elegy, or in this case, specifically this kind of extrapolate, extrapolated extemporization on one particular loss, whatever, as a generalized condition, as in memoriam is, the elegy, this in memoriam, this extrapolated elegy, teaches us what we know, but what we tend to deny. And that is that love is complex and, in fact, intrinsically shot through with loss and death. That love always is shot through with sometimes the bittersweet and poignant yearning and longing, which can be quite pleasurable, but is underwritten by loss, okay? right through to the catastrophe of grief, okay, which is the fact that any two people in love or whatever must lose one another or whatever through the fact of death at some point, or that we lose life, which we love, through the fact of death. And so too that grief is in fact always shot through with love, that intrinsically positive thing, okay, once again from the bittersweet loveliness of yearning and longing, which can be delightful forms of love. All right, to the ultimately joyful resolution, which is part of grief, provided in the kind of Kubler-Ross extent of the sort of stages of grief, or whatever, in acceptance. Not, as I've suggested all along in that Quaker witness or whatever, not in the getting over of a death, but in the going into death, where the lost life is ultimately, and this is the case if you read the rest of In Memoriam, as I hope you will do so, where the lost life is ultimately a affirmed profoundly, and more importantly for our purposes, absorbed by the grieving living, by posterity among whom we must count ourselves, often by genetic posterities, the children of loving couples, for example, and always by memory and by a novel accommodation of the self, newly and often with great pain and great effort, elevated by the loving incorporation of the lost beloved. So the taking on board of Arthur Henry Hallam, as this poem does by digesting, as it were, this kind of sacramental meat, the stuff, the materiality of the dead body, right? To utilize a peculiarly Christian metaphor to which Tennyson has recourse in a Christian age for all one ravaged by doubt in its own way. That is, I think, the cumulative argument of Tennyson's great poem, that in grief we find both the joy of love and in love we find also the great shattering catastrophe of grief. That is the cumulative argument of this poem and it's what, it's make, what makes it uh, as great as I find it to be. And given that it is now two o'clock, uh, that is the summation of my thoughts for you today, and I will leave it there for now. If there are any questions, I'm sure we can take them. I'm sure we're allowed a few extra minutes, but I've gone a little bit longer over the time that I'd intended to do. Anybody with things to say or questions to raise at this point? Contentment. Mary, Grace. Got the hand up. Mary Grace, 
Um, yes, just to say quickly, um, I looked at the beginning of the poem and I was reminded of something that you talked about in another class about how um, the lover when they write a love poem is not just thinking about the about the the lover but also about the poem and he says here sometimes i hold hold it half a sin to put in words the grief i feel yeah. and um it's and he says that that's because he's being inadequate and you know he's not really expressing his his thoughts adequately but it also seems like maybe he's having some guilt about the pleasure that he's having about writing this poem absolutely uh, absolutely and i think that that's uh extraordinary you know if one goes back to i just mentioned at the end that kind of kubler ross sense of the stages of grief or whatever you know among among the kind of plethora of, of 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 emotions which go into the affect of grief we experience denial doubt despair um but uh, among them also grief uh, i mean uh, also guilt uh, uh, you know survivors guilt and and uh, and and in and, and in the case that you're uh, iterating which is a reworking that that i've seeded among you it actually comes from wh orden who says that the beloved is concentrating the lover is concentrating less on the beloved than on the poem at hand. Um, the the talent that uh, Tennyson uh, has uh, this this anxiety that to some extent he is uh, parasitizing uh, the death of 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 Hallam for for present purposes. I think that's a a, a marvelous point. Uh, it's 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 a point that he um, with incredible increasing generosity towards the end of the poem as he comes to him posterity uh, and the marriage of Tennyson's cousin and so on, of Hallam's cousin and so on, um, begins to find and work his way through to a greater degree of light. But it's a, it's, it's a marvelous point, Mary Grace, and a very good one. Neil, I see your hands up too. Neil Brathett? Yeah, right. Um, hi. Uh, hi. I'm sorry to hear you're still in Italy. Are you, uh, are you being blocked from coming back or not? No, I, um, I. It's a case of choosing lockdowns at this stage. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, I just want to say uh, I enjoyed the whole lecture this time. For the first three lectures, I, I missed the first one entirely. Uh, the second one, I was frantically trying to get to grips with the technology. Right. And, uh, and then the last, the second, the third one as well. But of this one, I've heard the whole lecture, so I'm thrilled okay. about that. Great. And I also want to thank you for the uh, uh, Circle Circle Hills uh, video you pointed us to, which is is uh, wonderful. Uh, his life and so on. Uh, oh, that's that 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 sounds like Fanula's doing rather than mine. So. Um... Uh, bless her, but uh, I'm delighted that that suggestion's made. It's yeah, no, it, it, it's really worth watching, and uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, okay. and it, uh, yeah, I, on the poem itself, I I must go and do do a bit of Latin again. I I don't I can't, I can't decipher those numbers. They're not important. They're just numbers. Not important. Yeah, and then uh, I wondered whether there's any link between Dark House and Dickens's Bleak House. Never thought of that. Uh, never thought of that. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the, the times are. Uh, exactly. Exactly. You know, my first question goes to needing to know publication dates, and I, I last don't know the publication of Bleak House. Safe to say that it's a late Dickens. Um, which would suggest that it does come after, but. Uh, um, uh, there's this marvelous research tool called Google, Neil. <laughs> yeah, I, I suggest yes, you play that. Yeah. yeah, I'm using it heavily. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay. Thank you all. Tomorrow we um, 